Dear Corinne, dear Mr. Ischinger, ladies and gentlemen. All wars end at some point, but every war has its own special, its own unique end. This applies to states and societies, it applies to politicians, diplomats and the military, it applies to people on the home front and to every single soldier. At first glance it seems much easier to define the beginning of violent conflicts than their end. To this day people almost always associate the beginnings of war with dramatic or at least suggestive occasions that seem to provide historical orientation and you all know these moments. The defenestration of Prague in May 1618 as the beginning of the Thirty Years War, the shelling of Fort Sumter by troops from the American Southern States at the beginning of the American Civil War in April 1861, or the assassination attempt in Sarajevo in June 1941, the shelling of the Westerplatte by a German battleship near Gdansk in September 1939 or the invasion of Ukraine by Russian troops on February 24th, 2022 or October 7th, 2023 with the Hamas terrorist attack on Israel. But these seemingly unambiguous events say very little about the long-term causes of war, about previous histories about stages of escalation, about the notorious oft-sighted points of no return. Not infrequently it is only in retrospect that the beginning of a war develops the mythical quality for societies that we often find in cultures of remembrance. Just think of the idea of the general enthusiasm for war in August 1914, which we now know never really existed. This so-called August experience resulted in many ways from looking back a time after 1918 which for many Germans seemed much darker than the idealized good old days prior to 1914. Ladies and gentlemen, if this look at the beginnings of war already shows how easily apparent unambiguities dissolve in historical observation, then this erosion of security, one could perhaps call it, certainly applies to the end. Most historical paths to peace, they were torturous, they were repeatedly delayed, they were interrupted. The longer a war lasted, the more victims it accumulated over months and years, as can be said with regard to modern history, the more confusing, the more contradictory the paths to peace became. When and how a war ends, this process cannot be limited to the moment when the victors and the vanquished sign a treaty with each other. Complicated processes lie behind this moment from an initial ceasefire to a process of confidence building, a stable ceasefire, a preliminary peace and finally an international peace conference and perhaps a ratified peace treaty at some point. But, and Wolfgang Ischinger has already mentioned this, does a war end with a treaty or is the end heralded by the insight of the mutual exhaustion of resources gained from losses and sacrifices, which eventually leads to something like, as we've already heard, to something like a rational insight into the necessity of peace? Is this then followed by a window of diplomacy, or does peace only come about perhaps after years or even decades when trust reliable communication between former adversaries is restored. Is there, we might ask, a stable peace without reconciliation between individuals, families, communities? Is there peace without the recognition of victims and crimes and guilt and debt between entire societies? 
And finally, at what point do we know for a fact whether a treaty with signatures really creates peace? Or, as it was already mentioned in the introduction, whether peace is merely a tactical ceasefire, a temporary truce, a pause to mobilize new resources and then continue the war all the more resolutely. These are the questions we should be interested in this evening. I've already said that many of the paths from war to peace were lengthy. The Peace of Westphalia of 1648, which ended the Thirty Years' War, consisted of a complicated series of treaties that were signed in Munster and Osnabrück. This was preceded by a peace Congress that lasted for over five years, and even after these diplomatic efforts, the war could have flared up again at any time, according to many contemporaries. And similarly precarious, one could say, were the peace agreements during the almost uninterrupted wars of the French Revolution and Napoleon between 1792 and 1815. The wars surrounding the founding of new nation-states, the Italian nation-state in 1859-61, and the German Empire between 1864 and 1871, these wars were much shorter in comparison. At first glance, they were classic wars between states that ended with classic peace treaties. But this ideal, ladies and gentlemen, the ideal of a symmetrical war of states in which a decisive battle paves the way for politics and diplomacy, this ideal became fragile as early as the 1860s when the end of the American Civil War brought together many problems of the search for peace in modern times as if under a magnifying glass. Whenever I show this picture to my students in Freiburg without a signature, most of them guess that it shows a European city during the Second World War. But it is Richmond in 1865. This war, this American Civil War, showed what unrestricted violence over four years can mean. Unlimited violence that was no longer directed solely against soldiers, but also against the civilian population. This war, one could say, saw the birth of the modern vocabulary of war and peace. For example, the concept of unconditional surrender, or the concept of the home front. The First World War clearly demonstrated what the end of a long war that originally had been expected to be a short war meant. On November 11, 1918, the Germans and the French concluded, and you can already see this famous photo of the Allied peace delegation in front of the armistice wagon in the park of Compiègne, ladies and gentlemen. So on this 11th of November, 1918, or on June 28th, 1919, when the Treaty of Versailles was signed, the Germans and the French certainly did not make real peace with each other. The difference between what was written in the treaties and the continuation of the war in people's minds could hardly have been any greater in those moments. Both dates, one could say, November 11th, 1918 and June 28th, 1919, marked the end of acute hostilities on the Western Front of Europe, or the conclusion of the Paris Peace Conference for the German Reich, but they were formal moments, for in reality the results of this peace that was overburdened with expectations after the First World War provoked new violations and new crises through territorial provisions, through the problem of reparations, through the emphasis on war guilt which became the starting point for many revisionist obsessions. Ladies and gentlemen, there's hardly a story in the 20th century that shows you how strongly the war continues in people's minds after the end, after the formal end of a war, than the story between the Germans and the French in the early 1920s. 
This is a poster from the heyday of this post-war history, which clearly shows you that the conclusion of a treaty says nothing about how deep a bellicose disposition and mentality can remain in people's minds. As we know from many diaries and letters, it was perhaps the conclusion of the Treaty of Locarno in 1925 that symbolized something like a credible beginning of a real post-war period for many Germans and French, and that was seven years after the end of the First World War. And you can take this story even further, because in the minds of many Germans, the First World War may not even have ended until June 1940. What you can see here is a photo of German soldiers removing the original wagon from November um, 1918 from the um, Kempienje Museum. And it was in this very wagon that Adolf Hitler carried out the signing ceremony after the victory over France as a reversal of roles. In the mind of many Germans, Adolf Hitler won the First World War for the Germans in June of 1940 thus compensating for the defeat of 1918, which many Germans had not really accepted. A particularly important moment in German history, because we know that the Germans' approval of Adolf Hitler after this moment in June of 1940 was greater than ever before, a major problem for the opposition and the resistance. And it is precisely with this advantage in reputation, one could say, that Adolf Hitler would then, a few months later in 1941, wage a war of a completely different violence, completely different breaches of civilization in Eastern Europe against the Soviet Union. Ladies and gentlemen, with these introductory remarks, I would like to show that wars end in different ways, by military victory of one side, by a military stalemate, by a peace treaty based on compromise, by the intervention of third parties, or by the transformation of a war into a conflict of lower intensity of violence. The capitulation of a state of a warring party could happen under conditions, or as in the case of Japan and Germany after 1945, unconditionally. If, as a historian, I'm going to present the 10 theses of my book to you today, I'm naturally confronted with the question of what a look at history actually contributes to our understanding of the present. And I would like to give you a provisional answer to this question. No political crisis, not even the current crises, can be delegated to history, so to speak. I'm convinced that history does not repeat itself nor does it provide simple blueprints for political decisions. But history shows, in an almost immeasurable reservoir of times and spaces, which constellations led to which results and why. History reveals, one could say, history reveals patterns and logics of action. It clarifies ambivalences, often also paradoxical situations, and therefore, it immunizes against simple explanations, analogies, and comparisons. And if you look at the media nowadays, you all know that we are bombarded with analogies and comparisons. And some of those are more suggestive, and others are misguided. But one thing is clear. You have to develop your own judgment against this instrumentalization of history. And for this, I believe that this is immediately important to look at history. In this sense, history challenges us to engage with it. It allows us, as I would say, by looking at what is very distant to gain precisely the distance that is needed to see more clearly and to recognize more. I always call this the second glance, the sober analysis. So looking at the wars of the past shows us why it is worth to embrace history in order to better understand how wars come to an end in the present. It is less about knowing better than about seeing more. 
And against this background, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to explain the 10 theses I have developed in this book, some more detailed than others. I've not prepared a classic academic lecture. That was very important to me because I want to enter into a discussion with you and I believe that this also applies to Mr. Ischinger. And from my experience, this very often works with a combination of text and image and the story of war and peace is, needless to say, also a history of images and we know that right up to the present day. My first thesis is that the nature of war determines its end. We need to understand what's at the core of a war, what the constellation of the conflict is, what category of war it is, to be able to assess how such a conflict will end. Most of the wars we have seen in modern history, since the early modern period, since the 15th and 16th century, are not purely idealized types, such as civil wars or state wars, but are often amalgams, hybrids. A good example to show this is a war that, at first glance, you would interpret as a classic war between states, the war between Prussia and Austria in 1866, which ended with the Battle of Königgrätz and resolved the old duality between Prussia and Austria, and thus, you could say, paved the way for Prussia to achieve the small German solution of 1871. But, and this is one of the memorials from the 19th century that um, has always fascinated me, this war was also a German-German civil war. The Germania you see here is not a Germania raising her sword against France, but very unusual for a 19th century war memorial, it is a mourning Germania. It is a Germania mourning the fact that in this war of 1866, Germans and Germans fought each other. Prussians, Hanover, um, Hanoverians and electors from Hesse, Bavarians and many others. And this alone shows you this is not just a war between states, but also the possibility of a German civil war. And someone like Bismarck recognized this possibility, this potential of a German civil war very clearly when he argued that we must end this war politically and diplomatically as quickly as possible. You all know this picture. Five years later, in 1871, the founding of the small German nation state in the central area of the French nation, the French monarchy in the Imperial Hall, in the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles on January 18th, 1871. We know at first glance that this war is also a classic war of states, Prussia and the allied Germans on the one side and France on the other. But this war was also a war of states as well as a civil war because in the shadow of this war of states, Germany, Prussia against France, a bloody French civil war took place with the suppression of the French Commune in Paris. And during the suppression around 35,000 communards were shot in Paris. A trauma for French society to this very day. And here too, it is very important to recognize that this experience contributed significantly to the French side arguing that we must end this war quickly before we completely lose control of the civil war within France. And I would like to cite one last example to support this first thesis, and that is, of course, the big colonial wars that were fought in the 19th century. Here, as an example, the suppression, the genocidal suppression of the Nama and Herero uprising. When we see, and we will come back to this later, that during the 19th century there were major attempts to legally regulate war through international law, through major international conferences, then this attempt to legally regulate and contain war applies to wars between European powers or powers that were deemed worthy, but it does not apply to colonial wars. Colonial wars do not end with peace conferences, but they end in radical asymmetrical violence. And this is what I wanted to suggest with this image. <laughs> 
My second thesis, which I call the contingent dynamic, real decisive battles are rare, and the longer a war lasts, the more difficult it becomes to control it. And with regard to what we've experienced in Ukraine since February 2022, I think you will see, you will recognize much of what I would now like to present to you historically. Almost every war that historians study in modern times begins with military experts promising that this conflict can be controlled with absolute certainty, that you have the technology, the tactics, the strategy, the resources to bring about a fast decision and thus put politics and diplomacy back into the driver's seat. I want to float the thesis that this sequence, wars that end with a quick decision and give politics a window of opportunity, have always been the absolute exception. Of the wars I have reported on so far, I this, this actually applies to only two, namely the War of 1866 and the War of 1870-71. A lot more frequent, and actually the rule instead of the exception in the 20th century, is the erosion of this promise, the plans that become a waste of time. The most famous example of this is the Schlieffen Plan, with which the German Empire wanted to win the First World War within six weeks, and this Schlieffen Plan ended at the River Marne in a major catastrophe, and the result was that the hope that the young men would be home for Christmas turned into almost five years of war. And you could say that this experience will be repeated in many places during the 20th century. It was repeated in 1939 and 1941, of course, the hope of the Germans that after the so-called lightning victories of 1939-1940, they could repeat something similar in Russia. The Japanese hope of beating the United States with a decapitation strike. But we also find it in the Korean War, we find it in the Vietnam War, we find it in France's colonial wars, we find it in the Algerian War, and last but not least, we find it in the Soviet Union's Vietnam, namely the invasion of Afghanistan in 1979. You could say Vladimir Putin had exactly the same experience. In this world that we live in, there were many self-proclaimed experts who were quick to give Ukraine a maximum of 72 hours on this February 22nd, 2022. Why is this such an important moment when the promise of a short war turns into the reality of an incalculably long war? Well, first of all, it means that these societies at war are under enormous pressure to adapt because they have to continually succeed in the final the fin financial management, the management of resources, but also, if you like, the cultural and political interpretation of the war. And it also means something else. and. This is a mechanism that should not be underestimated. Once a war has broken out, it differs so fundamentally from the planned, predicted, prophesied war, then political and social regimes in such wars are faced with a potential crisis of legitimacy. And that means wars are in a way often prolonged because of the victims they have accumulated. What I mean by this is that in a war in which there are many victims, the compromise, the concession becomes more and more difficult because a concession that goes too far makes it clear to one's own society that your own sons, your own husbands, brothers have died in vain. This is a constellation that you can observe almost paradigmatically during the First World War, that all regimes starting in 1916, 17 onwards said we cannot make any concessions because every concession is a betrayal of the victims. It is an almost paradoxical situation that the greater the sacrifices of the war, the more difficult the path towards peace. The third thesis, the search for the right outcome, a bad peace can prolong the war. You could say this has been a classic since antiquity. If you were ever introduced to Carthage and Rome at school, then you are familiar with this example. It is a bit like the Battle of 
David against Goliath, the great Roman Empire expanding in the Mediterranean, which starts a war with Carthage, and after numerous military defeats, Carthage began to give ever greater concessions to Rome. Rome demands these concessions, and with every concession, the politicians in Carthage argue that war becomes less likely, peace becomes more certain. But exactly the opposite happens in Rome. The hawks, the warmongers, the war-oriented senators argue if Carthage makes these concessions, then we can go further, then we can demand further concessions. And in the very end, Carthage is not armed and is completely destroyed by Rome. This is a classic example of how unilateral concessions without a genuine willingness to make concessions and peace on one side does not bring about peace, but rather mobilizes war or perhaps even escalates violence. I could give you many other examples for this problem of a rotten peace, but I would like to single out one peace agreement, namely that of Brest-Litovsk, with which one could say the German Empire won the First World War in Eastern Europe in the spring of 1908. And you can see on this map how far the German troops had advanced. Incidentally, these are young lieutenants who in 1941 were often appointed to staff officer positions and who built their ideas of what this war would bring for Germany from 1941 onwards pretty much exactly follow up on what they had been taught as young officers in 1917-1918. And this map also shows the great importance of Ukraine even back then. To put it very clearly, Brest-Litovsk was nothing more than a tactical pause for Germany to solve the two-front problem and thus concentrate all military resources on an overall victory in the West that was still possible in the minds of the military and the political elites. An overall victory in the West intended to use the narrow window of opportunity until enough American soldiers had arrived in Europe to prevent this. And that explains why it didn't get, why after 1916 and above all 1917, why there were a large number of peace initiatives, not least the creation of President Woodrow Wilson's 14-point program, but why it took months and almost a year and a half after 1917 for this war to really end. And we know from the history of both the First and the Second World War, and something similar could be said for Vietnam and Korea, that it is precisely the final phase of such wars that ends up being particularly bloody. Violence escalates to make it clear to the opponent you have no chance of continuing the fight, or it is a fight for the best possible starting position for an upcoming peace conference. Perhaps the best known example, which is currently being used in many metaphors, analogies, is, of course, the concession policy of the victorious powers of 1918 towards Adolf Hitler in the 1930s, which is somewhat abbreviated and summarized under the term appeasement. And I would like to say two things about this problem of appeasement. We must understand that the politicians who pursued this appeasement policy had almost all experienced the First World War as young men. In other words, they were socialized with the idea that the First World War sh should be a war to end all wars. And the repetition of such a war, or perhaps even the increased violence, was beyond the imagination of many of these politicians. And the second thing is that the examples of France and Great Britain provide an almost paradigmatic example of how it had almost become impossible in the 1920s and 1930s to communicate armaments, resource management and preparations for war domestically because these societies had gone through the First World War. They focus on other issues, the expansion of the state, the welfare state, for both France and Great Britain the future of their colonial empires. Just think of the situation in India. So the preparation of a new European war is not on the political agenda 
in London and Paris. The third thing, and this is very important to me, and I'm very curious to hear what Wolfgang Ischinger has to say on this subject, the search for possible compromises and the willingness to make concessions, that is part of the core of diplomacy. The decisive factor, and this was lacking in 1938, was that there was no plan if an aggressor was ultimately not prepared to compromise. And that was the main problem for the British and the French. They had no concept for an aggressor like Hitler, who was not prepared to stop with the so-called Anschluss of Austria or with the so-called breakup of Czechoslovakia. And my fourth comment on the 1930s, and I believe we are also experiencing this at the moment with Ukraine and the Middle East, is the signaling effect that comes from major conflicts and their end. What do I mean by that? The signaling effect for Hitler was, I can keep going, and he exploited that. And we know that China, but also other actors involved in conflicts, think of Azerbaijan and Armenia, think of South America, that other actors are observing whether this rules-based order, as we would call it today, prevails or whether the party with the stronger military wins. It was no surprise that Hitler's achievement in 1938 sent a signal to other players, just as Hitler benefited heavily from the signaling effect of the occupation, the subjugation of Manchuria by Japan, for example, and the undermining of the international collective security system. In the end, there is a world war that Britain and France, I would say, until 1938, wanted to prevent at almost all costs. Let me repeat, the problem was not the search for a willingness to make concessions and compromises, but that there was no plan for an aggressor who was not willing to make concessions. The fourth thesis, the long end. Anyone who still sees a chance on the battlefield will fight as long as possible. Actually, this is something we have already heard several times over the course of this evening, but I want to emphasize it again and I absolutely agree with Wolfgang Ischinger, that is exactly the logic that we are dealing with with Vladimir Putin. Incidentally, this is also the reason why many Germans found it so difficult to come to terms with the end of the First World War. What you can see on this map is the armistice line of November 11th, 1918. Not a single Allied soldier is located inside of Germany, and for many Germans the end of the war could only be explained by an internal betrayal, the so-called step in the back myth. But the situation that the military leadership in Berlin conceded that the war could not be continued any longer wasn't reached until the late summer of 1918. And until then, most Germans also believed it will be difficult and we will have to limit ourselves, but the victorious peace that can justify all these hundreds of thousands and millions of sacrifices is still possible. This is something that I believe applies to almost all major wars of modern times. This clinging to the possibility of winning on the battlefield after all, through better resources, through time as a weapon, by weakening international coalitions, to turn the tide of war. And that is why I'm deliberately showing you two other photos to support this thesis, photos of the negotiations leading to the Paris Agreement of 1973 to end the Vietnam War, and what happened in April of 1975, something that would thwart the Paris Agreement. And you could say that both photos were made towards the end of a process where both sides, North Vietnam as well as the United States, kept arguing that they could still achieve their original goals on the battlefield. And even if in the case of the United States it is no longer the classic victory at some point, then at least it is the decent interval of, a, of an honorable peace that gets your own soldiers out. 
and that lets you withdraw from the defeat, the foreseeable defeat of South Vietnam. My fifth thesis, planning and forecasting. Available resources determine the tipping point of wars, but not necessarily the understanding of the actors. This is, if you like, an insight from economic history, including the financial history of wars. Wars in modern times are always also economic and resource wars. And if you look at objectifiable data, then it is absolutely clear that the German Empire no longer had a particularly good chance of winning the First World War by 1917 at the latest. And if you just look past Portoto at the production of combat aircraft in the Second World War, then it is clear that by 1943, at the latest, the war could no longer be won by Germany in terms of resources. But, and this is of decisive importance now, this objectifiable development says nothing about how individual political and military actors think. This includes the hope for new resources. This includes the hope for modern weapon systems. In both world wars, this always included the hope that one's own soldiers had better nerves. This includes the hope that wars will not be decided by weapon systems, but by nerves, by willpower. You could tell your own story of failed economic sanctions. This story would include Napoleon's continental blockade, but also the great hope of the British that the blockade of Germany's ports, thus cutting off the empire from supplies of raw materials in 1914, would quickly end the war. And none of that ever happened. Societies, and this is another very important deduction that I would make as a historian for the 19th and 20th century, societies in wars are incredibly adaptable. We know that many processes of economic development, but also of cooperation between science and industry, are often enormously accelerated and catalyzed by a situation of scarcity. And this ability is almost always stronger than the consistency with which economic sanctions are enforced. Therefore, the blunt weapon of economic sanctions that the West relied on heavily at the beginning of the war in Ukraine, this blunt weapon is no great surprise to me as a historian. My sixth, my sixth thesis, which Wolfgang Ischgler has already mentioned, is that not every war ends with a formal peace. This point is particularly interesting for me because it is perhaps the point where you can most clearly see how history has changed from the 17th century to the 20th century. You could say that the end of the Thirty Years' War marks the beginning of the victorious triumph of modern international law. This is a famous allegory on Hugo Grotius, one of the pioneers, the fathers of international law the law of nations, and this allegory depicts the peacemakers of 1648 gathered around a catafalque of Grotius, and behind it, of course, is the hope that after the experience of a confessional civil war with the leveling of the delineation between combatants and non-combatants with unleashed violence, that war could be tamed after these experiences. The Tame Bologna is, so to speak, the ideal of the 17th, 18th, 19th, and early 20th century. And in fact, and this can be demonstrated by historical evidence, the number of wars that ended with a formal peace treaty increased enormously between 1650 and 1914, from around 30 to over 80 percent. And this triumphant advance of international law was accompanied by what could be described as modern thinking in the 19th century that we are also familiar with in many respects. This is a picture by Henri Rousseau, the so-called publican and autodidact who repeatedly commented on events in his own life in his paintings. And this picture comments on the Algeciras peace conference which resolved the Morocco conflict between the German Empire and France. So the decisive factor here is 
that this picture is brimming with optimization. It is the optimism that war can be reduced to a thing of the past or to the lack of civilization and development. You have a plethora of sociologists and economists from 1914 who argue modern wars are actually only conceivable in agrarian societies. Modern industrialized societies such as the United States, Japan, Germany, Great Britain have so much to lose from a modern war that it cannot be in their interest to start such a war. And Rousseau argues precisely along that line, and you can see this very nicely on the left, that the future does not belong to the monarchies, the crowned heads that you can still see somewhere in there, but it is Marianne with the Phrygian cap and the laurel wreath as a symbol of the forward-looking French Republic. It is also the democratic republic as opposed to the autocratic monarchies that is being celebrated here. And this painting conveys something of this optimism, one could say of this globalism, the taming of war, the pacification before the First World War. Incidentally, also because it thinks globally, because you can also see representatives of colonial societies from Arabia, from Africa, from Asia. So, in other words, this customs officer from France, who is an avid newspaper reader, imagines that Europe is actually on the way of overcoming war. And now, enter the 20th century. And the 20th century will write a completely different story. Because what we see in the 20th century is that the number of wars that end with a formal peace treaty is radically decreasing. It's going down. In the period after 1945, only 10 to 15% of all wars end with a formal peace treaty. And here I can follow up on what Wolfgang Ischinger has said. If you no longer have classic wars between states, ask yourself the question, who has the authority to sign a treaty? Many conflicts and many wars end the way you see it here, namely with a ceasefire below a formal peace treaty, which, in the case of Korea, has been broken over 100,000 times to date. Even the war between Iran and Iraq did not end with a formal peace treaty, but with a UN resolution. And many conflicts in the Middle East also end with UN resolutions. What is important about this development? It means that without the consequences of international law, without the quality of a peace treaty, actors are always counting on the fact that a ceasefire can be broken below the threshold of escalating violence of war if the opportunity arises, that one's own interests, so to speak, can be pursued further. And this is precisely what leads to the many bleeding borders that you are familiar with, the asymmetrization of violence. Just think of the relationship between the two Koreas and you could show many other examples. So in other words, in a world where we are dealing with rather less formal peace treaties from the vantage point of history, the threshold for the use of asymmetric force has become lower rather than higher. My seventh thesis, the ambivalence of science. There's no peace without communication and those who humiliate the defeated turn peace into a ceasefire. This is based on a way of thinking that was of fundamental importance for the modern search for peace, namely the idea of equality, the basic equality of the peacemakers. I brought a picture that exemplifies this almost ideally. It's the meeting between Napoleon and the Russian Tsar after the Prussian defeat at Jena and Auerstedt, when Napoleon argues with this Russian Tsar, I'm now dividing up the European continent. And to prove his equal status, a peace pavilion is erected on the border river Memel. And you can see this moment here when Napoleon welcomes the arriving Tsar. In other words, the definition of a neutral place as a stage for the performance, the staging of equality. In reality, Napoleon is already planning the next war. And this gap between the 
idea of peace and equality and what actually happens already lets you recognize how strong the power of the image was, even in the 19th century, and how these images were also used for political purposes. In 1918, the situation is a completely different one. You could say that when the Paris Peace Conference began after the First World War, it was still taking place in many respects in the superficial forms in which other major peace conferences had begun, such as Münster and Osnabrück in 1648 or Vienna. And the picture you can see here is an example of this. The individual large delegations still have their official painters to capture important moments. And what you see here is the signing of the Treaty of Versailles by the two German delegates in June of 1919. But this conclusion of a peace treaty was emotionally charged in a way that would have been unthinkable for their peers in the 19th century. This postcard shows the so-called Cinq Gueux Cassé. These are five French soldiers, easily recognizable, with severe injuries to their faces. And these soldiers are, and this is clearly not shown in the picture, they are posted in a window alcove shortly before the German delegation was brought into this Hall of Mirrors at Versailles on June 28, 1919. And shortly before this German delegation enters the hall, Georges Clemenceau, the French Prime Minister, silently shook hands with these five soldiers. Four days later, a photograph was taken and every French school child knew this photograph well into the 1970s. There are no important history books in any secondary school in France that wouldn't include this postcard. And within six months, this postcard sold over 800,000 copies in France in 1919. The reaction of many British and American diplomats to this scene is very interesting. They wrote in their diaries, this is no way to make peace. We should actually have an interest in strengthening the newly established Weimar Republic. It is not an autocratic state. It is no longer the military monarchy of the Hohenzollern, but it is a fairly progressive republic which will come under pressure if it signs this treaty and this pressure will be all the greater if the Germans get the impression that they are being morally and emotionally disqualified. And what they are experiencing in 1919 is basically a divide. On the one hand the hope that war could be overcome in a world with more international law with new institutions such as the League of Nations and on the other hand an unprecedented emotionalization. I'm also showing you this picture because there is a metaphor in the early modern search for peace that explains this difference. Until well into the 19th century, all peace treaties contained the formula of the so-called oblivion, of benevolent forgetting, a kind of knot line to get the war out of people's heads. It's a very important legacy of the early modern confessional civil wars. Benevolent forgetting. And what emerged in the 20th century, and that is a major historical change, is, if you like, exactly the opposite. It is not benevolent forgetting that makes peace possible, but processing the victim experience, processing the suffering, the prosecution of crimes. And for no society, neither in Ukraine nor in the Middle East, will there be a return to something like benevolent oblivion. That is quite clear. But realize the enormous challenges that such a peace project will then face. And for this question, for the question of emotionally processing war experiences in Ukraine, the question of images, of communication, of media is of course of fundamental importance. This is a poster with a fantasy of what should happen to the German delegates who signed this Treaty of Versailles. And you all know that one of the decisive preconditions for the rise of National Socialism was the incessant instrumentalization of the Treaty of Versailles against the Weimar Republic, the so-called fulfillment politicians.
My eighth and penultimate thesis, height of the fall and disillusionment, overburdening peace with expectations can prolong the shadow of war. That is, if you like, perhaps one of the great dilemmas of the 20th century, the danger of overstretched peace. In a way, it worked better in Vienna. It worked better in Vienna because these people, these representatives who met in Vienna share many things, have many things in common. And that is also something that we certainly no longer have in this form today. Supporters of a monarchical system meet in Vienna, generally speaking, in Vienna, aristocrats who share something like a common world meet. This makes it much easier for Metternich, for example, to integrate the French representative Talleyrand and it would never have occurred to Metternich to humiliate France. He says, we wage war against Napoleon, but not war against the French. And a post-revolutionary, post-Napoleonic France that we humiliate will sooner or later become a case of conflict, a case of civil war, and that will bring us even greater problems in Europe. But the situation in Vienna is also different because these representatives of the monarchical system have no regard for the population. There is no formula of national self-determination, but in a certain sense they set policies while ignoring the population. And this gives rise to a security architecture that we cannot simply translate into the modern world. That's why I believe that Munkler's argument of the new pentarchy and that refers to this five-part international system after 1815, does not really fit anymore because today we are dealing with very different domestic political and socio-political actors who, unlike in, 19, uh, in 1815, no longer necessarily share the same values. Why did I talk about an overstretched peace? Because after the end of the First World War, I believe it became clear what can happen when peace is being overstretched. What you can see here is the Arab delegation at the Paris Peace Conference. And you all know this gentleman, at least in theory, the gentleman on the right in this wonderful hybrid of a British officer's uniform and an Arab headdress. That is Thomas Edward Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia. Why is this image an iconic image for the history of the 20th century and the Middle East? Behind this image, there's the hope of the Arabs to acquire their own state, a state that the British had at least not ruled out during the First World War in order to gain the support of the Arabs in the fight against the Ottoman Empire. In fact, this Arab delegation is invited to Paris for the first time in the history of diplomacy, Faisal is giving a speech in Arabic and this common Arab state never existed. For many Arabs, Arab intellectuals of the 1920s and 30s, this is a very crucial point because they argued that the universalist ideal of self-determination may apply to southern Slavs, Poles, Czechs and Slovaks, but it does not apply to us. In other words, liberal internationalism, the project of the League of Nations and thus also the idea of security that can be collectivized is already lacking in credibility at this point. What is happening in the Middle East is what you can see on this map, namely the division of this region according to classic one could say colonial standards of the 19th century. These are the famous Greece pencils with which officials in the Catersay and in Whitehall drew borders. And from this emerge mandated territories and many problems without which I believe the history of conflict in the Middle East cannot be understood. If you want to understand where the credibility crisis of Western politics comes from, the Middle East cannot be understood without the First World War, and particularly the end of the First World War. There were three models in the First World War that did not fit together. The Balfour Declaration, 
There's the promise of a homestead for the Jewish people. There's the Sykes-Picot Agreement, classic colonial partition. And there's the promise to the Arabs, at least the prospect of it, to establish a pan-Arab state. This is an example of how to overload a piece with a global vocabulary, if you like, because not only did the European peoples from the former empires refer to this concept of self-determination, but also the representatives of these stateless communities, or very importantly, the colonial societies. A young Ho Chi Minh traveled to Paris. He has no official delegate status, but he wants to negotiate in Paris that the Vietnamese soldiers who fought for France in the First World War are treated no worse than French veterans. And when he's bawled out by a third-rate French colonial official, he begins to search for a radically different model of order and will later find it with the Bolsheviks at the Baku conference where Zhu Enlai, the young Nehru, and many others meet. So this is an example of how an overstretched peace can give rise to new potential for conflict, in this case, the conflict potentials of the future decolonization processes of the 20th century. My ninth thesis, doing peace. When the treaties are signed, the work on peace begins. This thesis, which Wolfgang Ischinger has already mentioned, is particularly important to me. Why? Because Actually, when we look at the end of wars in the 19th and 20th centuries, we almost always see that the treaty is one thing and the long-term collective historical mental processes are something else. When the Treaty of Versailles was signed, Jan um, Smuts, one of the fathers of the League of Nations, wrote a famous essay in the New York Times the day after the treaty was signed. He writes, actually free of illusions about all the things that didn't work in the Treaty of Versailles. But he says that we now have the League of Nations, we have a young generation of diplomats who want to make something of this peace. And on June 30th, 1919, he writes, peace is not a moment, it is a long-term process. And no generation of politicians and diplomats can afford to bow out and say, but we've signed treaties, but rather what is written in the treaties must be shaped, adapted, and adjusted, and every generation has to do this again and again. And such a peace policy, peace building policy, I would absolutely insist on this, is represented by someone like Gustav Stresemann. And if you remember, I told you earlier this basically bellicose war poster from 20, 1923 that I've shown you where the war continues in the minds of the Germans and the French. And just a few years later, his party, the DVP, used an image of Gustav Stresemann looking across the Rhine with an open mind. And you can see the bridge of Remagen in the foreground. And this is, of course, an attempt to capitalize on the Locarno Treaty for the Weimar Republic's domestic political capital. When this election poster was printed, Gustav Stresemann had already been dead for a year. And in the context of the global economic crisis and domestic political polarization, it was no longer possible to translate these foreign policy successes into a stabilization of the Weimar Republic. But it explains to you, and this is what Gustav Stresemann stands for, that the work on peace does not end with a treaty and that of course applies to many other conflicts as well and I'm sure we will come back to this in the discussion with Wolfgang Ischinger. The moment in Dayton that put an end to this Yugoslav war of disintegration is just a moment and not a process. But if you look at the process then of course you will realize what results it can lead to Bosnia-Herzegovina today is basically a dysfunctional state. Two entities, 10 cantons, 15 governments, 160 ministers, a three-member presidency that rotates every eight months, and 
basically political elites that do not really want to take on the responsibility to pacify this polity. I only want to hint at what shaping peace after the signing of treaties means. For these difficult tasks you need actors who do not only have a robust mandate, such as the United States in this case, but who are also prepared to remain engaged in such a conflict region with great perseverance. Let me say just one thing on this. How would the European post-war time after 1945 have been possible without the involvement of the United States by way of the Marshall Plan? If you want to achieve peace, you have to give people in conflict areas something like a long-term perspective. And my last and tenth thesis, paradoxes end. Not every victory is a win and some defeats become opportunities. I'm not trying to sanctify victory or defeat in any way. I just want to encourage you to take another look at such moments in history. If you look at Russia's defeats in the 19th century, for example, such defeats were decisive moments in the reform debate. Russia's defeat in the Crimean War fueled the discussion about what actually distinguishes Russia from Western Europe. It was the beginning of the great reforms. The defeat in the Russo-Japanese War is the moment in 1905 when the Tsar switches from an autocratic to a constitutional monarchy and for the first time a parliament the Duma is elected. Compared to Europe, you could say that this is all happening very late, but the defeat is also a moment of reflection on the internal reasons that led to the defeat. The best known and I think most fascinating example of this is the Prussian defeat at Jena and Auerstedt. I have to say this at this moment because we are in the vicinity of the reconstructed Hohenzollern Palace. This defeat of Prussia is the starting point for the Prussian reforms, which lead to a great deal of modernization for Germany. The modern municipal constitution, the concept of the citizen in uniform, the idea of compulsory military service, freedom of trade, the modern university that becomes an export success here in Berlin, so to say. The defeat of France in the war of 1871 is the beginning of the educational republic because it is argued that we also lost this war because we did not educate the society well enough because we did not provide a good education to many people and one could cite many more examples the last two pictures i'm going to show you can perhaps again make it clear that the unconditional surrender of both germany and japan was of course a prerequisite for fundamentally breaking with a certain kind of past. And then, of course, to gain new opportunities from this break. This is a debate that is currently being conducted intensively in my field, for example, following the publication of the book by my colleague Martin Schulze-Wessel, who I think rightly argues that Russia also has this opportunity if it ever breaks with its imperial past. In this respect, even a defeat can lead to something like a long-term learning process. That brings me to the end, and I want to come back to the question I asked at the very beginning, namely, how does it currently look like when it comes to learning from history? The sentence by the Spanish-American philosopher George Santayana that was often quoted today that those who do not remember history are condemned to repeat it. The French historian Alexis de Tocqueville, one of my stylites, would not have come up with that. After Tocqueville's, or according to Tocqueville's experiences in the revolution of 1848-49, he confessed that, quote, one often perishes in politics because one has too good a memory. Memory becomes an obstacle to the perception of the present if you have already been at the center of past events and believes that they can avoid the mistakes of the past. Tocqueville's conclusion from this constellation was, quote, Even if humanity 
always remains the same. Every historical process is different. The past does not teach us much about the present and the old images that are forced into new frames always work badly." End of quote. Ladies and gentlemen, there is what I consider to be an almost historical philosophical problem behind this, namely the problem of singularity and repetition. Singularity and repetition are not absolute opposites in history. They are rather intertwined. This is what the great historian Reinhard Kasselig has tried to explain with the term structure of repetition. This is based on the idea that the singularity of history that has happened presupposes certain structures of repetition, just as singularly speaking without the recognizability of vocabularies or the repeated validity of linguistic grammar rules cannot function. And even the trust in justice and legal certainty requires the iterative, the repeatedly reinforced law. Caesura and repetition are therefore linked and intertwined. The upheaval, the singularity of history presupposes recurrence. In this sense, there are no cyclical repetitions of historical experiences such as 1914, 1939, or 1941, because they were singular events. But, and this is what I've tried to show you this evening, there are interpretative structures, leitmotifs, tapoi, that people fall back on when they appropriate history. Let's just think of scenarios of threat or dissent or motives of betrayal. Anyone who knows about these and other structures of repetition certainly does not have a blueprint for the pacification of the world, but they create precisely the distance that allows us to see more clearly and recognize more. And in this unsettled world, that seems to me to be quite a lot. Thank you very much.